Welcome everyone to ChessLecture.com. My name is International Master Bill Pascal. It's my pleasure to bring you new, a new chess video presentation series. This series is entitled A Secret Opening Weapon for Black Against D4. It's much harder to find a winning active defense, a secret weapon for black against D4, than against E4. If you think about d4 versus e4, white is not opening up his king as much. And in general, it is harder to play for a win when the opponent isn't opening himself up as much. I find that e4 is a more uncompromising game. Against d4, playing for a win is not easy at all. We've got to try to do something active. So my suggestion is to play the Blumenfeld Gambit, which begins with the moves d4, knight f6, c4, e6, knight to f3, you can only play this against knight to f3, c5, d5, and now b5. I found this to be an excellent secret weapon. I don't believe, fundamentally, it's as good as some of the main line openings like the Nimzo Indian and the Queen's Indian and the let's say, Queen's Gambit declined, but if you have to play for a win or if you really want to play for a win and have a little bit of fun, it's a good opening. It's not on sound in any way. And it leads to a very dynamic game. And I think the Blumenfeld Gambit is something that a lot of players, even at the Grandmaster level, are turning to. And I can name a few names. For example, uh, from the Ukraine, Volokitin, a very, very talented young prodigy. He's used it very much in recent times. The Iranian Grandmaster um, Magami, uh, he's used it quite a few times. Everybody, you know, I've seen, uh, for example, Chris Ward, the author and the theoretical expert from England, has used it numerous times. So this opening, it's somewhat dangerous, but basically sound, and it's been used by a lot of good players, so you should give it a try yourself. There are two main things that can happen here. The gambit can be accepted or declined. I'm going to break up the series into several different parts, give you recommendations on each variation. Basically, our first and most common move, and I'm going to cover this today, is bishop to g5. And I'm not going to be able to cover all of bishop g5 today, but a part. So one particular variation, we're going to break it up into little parts. And our first lecture is on something I call the Havashi variation. Basically, this move was played for the first time in the game Joner versus Havashi, Debrecen, Hungary, 1925. So I'm naming it after this relatively unknown player, Havashi, because it's a variation that doesn't really have a name. Now, what I call the Havashi variation begins here with the move E takes D5. E takes D5 followed by the basically forced c takes d5, and now d6. d6. Different moves are possible here. Other moves have been played. For example, h6 has been played in this position. I'm recommending d6. And again, this has been played by Megami, this has been played by Chris Ward, this has been played by Volokitin. I recommend it. It's an interesting line, and uh, it's pretty pretty good, and I think it's maybe better than some of what used to be considered the main lines. So d6, the Havashi variation, we're going to see what happens here. And one particular variation we're going to cover today, what I call the Vagignon variation. So Vagignon in 1971, after d6, we got e4. This is the main move, almost universal here. e4 protecting the pawn on d5, creating a classic center pawns on e4 and d5, incidentally attacking the b5 pawn. Basically, e4 is almost a universal move here. Point is, black can't take, of course, because he's pinned. And also, there's the problem with the b5 pawn. So black basically has to do something to protect his pawn on b5. The best move, which, by the way, was played by Habashi in Debrecen 1925 in that game against Yoner, a6. So we're kind of keeping the tension, protecting b5. It may look strange, but these advanced pawns on the queen side control a lot of squares. And I think that white center is not so easy to protect. 
Because with this advanced pawn on b5, basically, his natural moves with knight to c3 aren't working very well because we can push forward in some variations to b4. So very often, white can't develop naturally with a knight coming to c3. And this variation has been scoring pretty well lately. I'm going to cover, in a couple of different series uh, volumes here, the whole of this variation with d6. But this one particular lecture that I'm doing today, I'm going to cover just one particular move that I thought for a long time is the most dangerous. Although fairly rare, very rare actually, I find it to be very dangerous. a4 here. Now this is not so rare. This is pretty common. But the follow-up that you're going to see is a little bit rare. So after a4, we're going to continue with bishop to e7. Bishop e7, this is the point of the variation for black. And I'm not recommending something that I haven't played myself. I played this on a number of occasions, and I've really done okay against a number of strong players. So I wholeheartedly recommend this opening. Maybe not as your main opening, but as a good, again, surprise weapon. So bishop e7, now we're breaking the pin against the bishop on g5. Now the bishop on g5 feels kind of silly on g5. It's pinning nothing. We're ready to castle, and we're putting pressure on the center. Already black is threatening knight takes e4. And again, knight c3 is no good because of b4. Now after bishop e7, white has a choice in this position of what to do. Later on, we're going to see knight on b to d2 and other moves. Today we're going to focus on the positional approach, which is attributed to the great Grandmaster Vaganyan, which he played against Gregorian in the USR Championship 1971. So the USSR Championship 1971, the game is Vaganyan Gregorian. And in some books, this was recommended as basically like more or less the right way and the refutation of this Havashi variation with bishop e7, with d6 and bishop e7. Bishop takes f6, so just taking right away. This is kind of a lesser known move. I've seen a lot of strong players deal with this system in recent times, in the last two or three years, and very few players, almost none, have come up with bishop takes f6. Obviously it's a strong bishop, but it's a very dangerous positional line if black isn't accurate, and that's why I wanted to cover it in my first installment of the Secret Weapons series on the Blumenfeld. So bishop takes f6 has only been played in a handful of games. We're going to talk about those games now, because I felt this was a particular problem. After bishop takes f6, bishop takes f6 is forced, and now white plays a takes b5. And admittedly, we have a very strong dark-squared bishop, but white's strategic Vaganyan, who was a great positional player in the Armenian style, um, he's going to play this in a purely positional fashion. White is going to try to dominate the white squares completely in the position and try to turn the dark squared bishop, black's dark squared bishop, into a kind of specter or ghost. So he's going to put everything on the board on the white squares and sort of isolate against that dark squared bishop, making it, again, like a ghost. So a useless piece, if, if nothing is on the dark squares, I can't attack anything with that piece. That's the strategy white is employing. My argument is that black's position is fundamentally solid. It should be okay. After bishop takes f6, a takes b5, bishop takes b2. I've seen people speculate that possibly you can sacrifice a pawn not taking on b2, but I don't really see enough compensation. So I think that bishop takes b2 is basically forced. So again, we followed the game Vaganya versus Gregorian, 1971 Leningrad, rook a2, and now basically the best and forced move is bishop back to f6. So the smoke clears a little bit, and the pawns are equal. Black has a strong dark squared bishop, but it's not clear if that piece can play a key role. Now the continuation in this game, which was held to be an advantage for white for, for a long time, um, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure that white has that big of an advantage now, after a recent game that I've seen. After bishop takes f6, bishop takes f6, takes on b5, bishop takes b2, rook a2, bishop back to f6, white plays knight on b to d2. And here, 
the concept becomes clear. White wants to use the c4 square for his knight. He's going to sit that knight there. Once the tension sort of resolves between the a and the b pawns, white is going to plant his knight on c4, where it attacks the, the backward pawn. I shouldn't call it exactly backward, but the sensitive pawn at d6. So it's going to try to attack the base of black's pawn chain at d6, which is a common weakness in Benoni kind of structures which we have here. I think that black is okay, but he has to be very accurate here. So after knight on b to d2, Vaganyan Grigorian continued castles, which is correct. And now white to play, keeps the tension. Bishop to d3. Bishop d3 protecting e4, just getting developed. Now black can't do anything to resolve the pawn tension until he protects his rook on a8. So play is pretty much forced here. I, I don't really see another way for black. Bishop to b7 to protect the rook on a8. And now we resolve the tension. Bishop b7, castles for white. And finally, a takes b5. a takes b5. The rooks are traded on a8. Rook takes a8. Bishop takes a8. And now naturally, bishop takes b5. So... This is kind of like the starting position for this whole variation. It's all pretty much forced after bishop e7, bishop takes f6. This is pretty much all black can do. But I think that his position is not bad. You just have to be a little bit careful here. Basically, I think white is going to have to give up this variation in the long run if black plays well, because it simplifies the game a little bit too much. I don't think that white has that great winning chances here because he simplified the game a little bit too much. Black has a weakness at d6. White also has a resulting weakness at e4. And this is kind of a key point. The other thing is that the dark squared bishop, although it's not actually able to attack anything, controls a tremendous amount of squares on the dark squared diagonal. And this can be a very strong piece in the end game. So things are not so easy for white here. One problem for black is the bishop is silly at a8, and this should be the first plan that black realizes. I've seen some players kind of go wrong here, and um, I'm going to show you how actually Grigorian went wrong against Vaganyan. He drew the game, but I think he was much worse. After bishop takes b5, we play knight to d7, which I think is a good move, necessary to develop, and correct. So knight to d7... And now Vaganyan played knight to c4. And this is a logical move. Planting the knight on the strong square, putting pressure on d6. Classic Benoni kind of strategy. One thing that you have to watch out for in this variation, particularly in this line, is a white bishop planting itself on c6. And after the capture on c6, the resulting passed pawn can be quite dangerous. And that's how I think Gregorian went slightly astray here, not respecting that threat enough. After knight c4, now we played knight to b6, and I think this is a good move. Notice white would like to play, say, knight a5 and put the knight on c6, but that move fails tactically. For example, knight a5, knight takes d5, winning a pawn for black, because the knight is unprotected. So life is not so easy for white. Vaganyan makes the classic maneuver knight e3, avoiding the trade of pieces when you have more space and control over the position. This is a strategically correct thing to do. So after knight e3, the question is, what should black play here? Gregorian was able to draw this game eventually, but I feel he got the worst of it. After knight e3, he played a move here, queen e7, which for me is a little bit strange because he's inviting later knight coming to f5. He's not taking care of the c6 square with the positional threat of the bishop planning itself there. So I think that queen e7 is not the best. I think the best move for black here would have been queen c7 or bishop to b7 with the idea of queen c7 and a quick mobilization, this should be the plan. Get the bishop off the worst square on a8, get the queen to c7, 
get the rook open and put the rook on the open files on a8 or perhaps b8. So this is where Gregorian went wrong against Vagnon. He did draw the game anyway, but the best plan would have been to play a quick bishop b7 followed by queen c7 and the mobilization of the rook via a8 or b8. And I think that black is okay here. His strong dark square bishop compensates for white's lock on the white squares. So in the actual game, Vagnon versus Gregorian, after knight e3 he played queen e7, and white, Vagnon, played the simple queen d3, which is very strong. Sitting on those white squares, guarding e4, preparing to get his rook in the game via b1, obviously not a1, the bishop's controlling that square. I think that Vagnon is better here, and he was actually putting serious pressure on black after g6 to prevent knight f5, and also to give the bishop retreat squares. Vagnon played rook b1, and after those moves, rook b1, we saw the classic idea, bishop g7, bishop c6. So trading off the bishop pair and trying to establish a strong passed pawn at c6. And after bishop c6, I think black was in a very unpleasant situation. So instead of allowing this, we go back once again, just to remind our listeners, the best plan would have been not queen e7, but bishop b7, followed by queen c7, ruling out any possible bishop c6, respecting that threat to the utmost, and getting the rook in the game via b8 or a8. And I think black is compact and okay here. Now, I'm going to continue the lecture with a very interesting game. So, not many games have been played here recently. Only two other games in this particular variation. I will caution our listeners, though, that you know people seem to know about this. I played a blitz game with Grandmaster Majoramov, and he immediately went right for this Vaganyan variation. So here, Elmar Majoramov, who is a tremendously strong player, a very, very strong positional player, in a blitz game against yours truly, when confronted with this variation, instantly played nine bishop takes f6. Bishop takes f6 and reeled off the whole thing that Vagignon played. So although only three games have been played in the database with bishop takes f6, people know about it. Strong grandmasters know about it. Maybe they just haven't had a chance to repeat Vagignon's game, but say they remember the game. So you've got to be prepared for this. Basically, we're going back now to Position after rook takes a8, bishop takes a8, bishop takes b5, knight to d7. And we're going to look at some alternatives here to Vagnon's knight c4. One game was played several years ago, and um, queen a4 was played. And I don't think that this objectively is a problem, but you have to be accurate here. Queen a4, black has two choices, knight e5 or knight b6. And I, at the first thought, I wasn't really sure which one is better. But then I realized there's a big difference, because if black plays knight e5 here, knight takes e5, bishop takes e5, bishop c6, and white really clamps on those white squares. And I think he's better in this ending, forcing the trade of the bishop, possibly recapturing with the pawn on c6, good knight versus bad bishop situation. I'm not saying black is lost, but I think it's unpleasant. So after queen a4 in the one game in my database, black played knight b6, and that's a good move. Because that, by hitting the queen on a4, denies white a little bit of his control over that c6 square. And after queen a5, queen c7, one game continued with something like knight c4, rook b8. And black was able to maintain control over c6, as well as defending his knight on b6, everything was okay. He was able to pull back the queen to d8, so it was protected by the bishop and by the rook, and he was able to defend successfully. I believe that game was played in 2003, and um, black should be perfectly okay there. So now we move on to our most recent game, very recent game, and this is Gdanski, strong grandmaster from Poland, 
against Willemsey, T. Willemsey, played in the Capel Le Grand Open 2006, just a few months ago in February um, 2006, we see, going back now on the board, a new move. Now, I don't know if Grandmaster Gdansky prepared this or it was just simply over the board, something he found. But anyway, it's a new move. Bishop takes a8, bishop takes b5, and now knight d7, queen to b3. Now at first I thought this is just, well, this is just a move, and uh, Grandmaster Gdansky probably didn't expect this variation, etc., etc. But if you put the position into Fritz, say Fritz 8 or Fritz 9, or any strong computer program, it seems to come up with queen b3 as one of its top two suggestions, which is significant. So, you know, there's a chance that maybe this was computer analysis, but it would be very hard to believe. The queen has a certain third rank mobility that ends up being relevant here. But this player, Will Emsey, played fantastically in this game. After queen b3, he played knight to e5. And now after the natural exchange on e5, knight takes e5, bishop takes e5. Notice the queen is on b3, not on a4. So his control over c6 doesn't make the possibility of bishop c6 a reality. It would be too weak after bishop c6, bishop takes c6, d takes c6. The pawn can be surrounded by a quick queen c7 and rook c8. I think back is okay there. So... That's not so much the threat right now. And in this instructive game, the second player, Will Emsey, had no problems. In fact, he was clearly better after just a few moves. To show you how dangerous this variation really is, a strong grandmaster playing a lesser master, after just a few moves leaving theory, the grandmaster was in a clearly worse position. After knight takes e5, bishop takes e5, black played very well here. Knight c4, Bishop d4, now queen to g3. And at first glance, it looks like the second player is in a lot of danger. But after queen g3, he pounds white with his pawn break f5. An amazing sort of tactical, tactically perfect move. Opening up possibilities of attack against f2, undermining the white center with the bishop, threatening d5, breaking apart the white center, it just turns out that white isn't only not better here, he's worse. After f5, he's just worse, and he was lucky to even keep the game in the realm of equality. After f5, e takes f5, black made a serious inaccuracy. So, Will Emsey made his first mistake, really, of the game. It may be his only mistake. After e takes f5, he simply recaptured on f5 in the game from the Capel Open 2006. All black should do is play bishop takes d5 instead. This is a lot stronger. A lot stronger. Black is clearly better after bishop takes d5 in Gdansky versus Willemsey. What he probably missed, which a lot of people would have missed, is that knight takes d6 doesn't really work very well because of the move rook f6. After rook f6, black is clearly better because he has these just raking bishops attacking toward the white king side. The knight will have to retreat, say knight back to c4, and now rook takes f5, and we just have threats of rook g5 winning immediately, raking bishops, um, and outside paths pawn as well, giving us another advantage, kind of long-term endgame advantage. So, Grandmaster rated over 2550 with the white pieces after 20 moves against this variation. He could have been in danger of losing. And he was lucky to go on to draw the game after the inaccurate, the only inaccurate move actually by Black in this game. E takes f5, rook takes f5. So, after rook takes f5, White was able to bail out. Bailing out with queen takes d6, Rook takes d5, and in the resulting endgame, the Grandmaster was able to hold the balance. The Queen takes Queen e6 check, King h8. I think black is a little bit better here.
But maybe it's not, as, not quite as strong as the other variation. After king h8, white has this move, which really takes the steam out of black's initiative. Bishop c6. So trading this super dangerous bishop that was on the long diagonal neutralizes black's advantage. And Grandmaster Gdansky was able to draw this game against his opponent, who incidentally was 150 rating points lower than him. So the game was a draw much later. It would be kind of unimportant to show the rest of this particular game. I think this is a kind of equalish position at this point. The bishop is quite strong. The knight is quite strong. Bishop c6 forces the, the trade against the bishop pair, which is a very good policy and neutralizes black's advantage. But an interesting game in this Havashi variation, we're going to cover other parts of this variation with bishop g5 in the Blumenfeld, as well as the Blumenfeld accepted. This Havashi variation with d6 and bishop e7, I think is one of the most important and critical variations. And the positional approach that we saw today from Vaganyan with bishop takes f6 has to be carefully met. I look forward to doing the rest of the video series on the secret weapon for black, and I hope you stay tuned for every part of the series and finding interesting ideas as well in this particularly dynamic and sharp winning attempt for black. The secret weapon for black against d4, the Blumenfeld, will continue with part two very soon. This is International Master Bill Paschal signing off from chesslecture.com.